All right. So today we're going to be going into the next uh, lesson of our Getting Started with Amateur Radio series. And I know everybody in the room is already a licensed operator. You're a licensed operator, yes. Everybody in the room is already a licensed operator. So hopefully everybody has been on the air at least once. But um, for posterity and for those who may watch this recording later, we're going to just run through this uh, really fast. So let me see if I can advance to the next slide. Or there we go. All right. Getting started. Okay. So you joined a club. You're here. Uh, you passed the test. You got your license. You bought a radio. You programmed your radio. These are the things that we talked about <clears throat> in previous sessions of our Getting Started series, right? So what's the next thing that you want to do? Well, you want to get talking. So there's a few things that you have to do to do that. You, you can just hang on to it if you want, Neil, and I'll grab it after. Uh, find a frequency, your club or area might have a standard load. We have one here. Uh, you can use repeater finder to find a frequency or talk to your local repeater coordinator in your area. Or you can ask other hams what frequencies are commonly used. That's a great thing to have a club for. So you can say to your club members, hey, what frequency do you guys usually monitor? And then you can switch to that frequency and, and try to reach out to them. Uh, you can join a net or you can just say CQ. Um, a lot of people say don't say CQ on repeaters. So we'll, we'll talk about that some more in a minute. But um, uh, Or you can just, on a repeater, typically you would just say your call sign. Um, we also had a class last year, almost exactly a year ago, as a matter of fact, on making your first QSO. The QSO being a conversation with someone on the radio. Okay. So you can go back and review that presentation if you would like. So finding a frequency. Uh, last month, we talked about this in our Programming Your Radio class. There's a link to that class presentation. There are usually some repeaters that are commonly used in your area. Here in the Salt Lake Valley, what's probably the most common repeater that's used for just general chatting? The 6-2, right? Farnsworth Peak. So that repeater has been around for how many years? More, more than 50 years, I swear. Uh, that, re that repeater has been up for a long time. It's, well, that may be true. I don't know. But, uh, but that repeater has been here for a long time. And yeah, that is one of the fairly common repeaters around here. It has a very wide coverage. It's up on Farnsworth Peak, blah, 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 blah. Farnsworth Peak, which is out to the west over there. And it covers pretty much the entire Salt Lake Valley down into Utah Valley and up into Davis County pretty well. And it also covers to the west out well past Tooele. In fact, I know people have hit it from Wendover. So... Uh, that is a very, uh, very good wide coverage repeater. And if you start talking on that repeater, you're very likely to find someone who's willing to talk. Um, here in, in Murray, we have a repeater, sort of. But uh, at, at the moment, our repeater, at the moment, our repeater is not operating and Dan will talk about that later, but, uh, but we do have a repeater for the Murray Amateur Radio Club. Hopefully we get the problems with that resolved and we are able to continue using that again. Um, one thing you can do that I highly recommend is listen to various repeaters and you'll hear other people talking. That's a great way to find out what repeaters are active is if you scan around from channel to channel and find some repeaters where people are talking, those will be good ones for you to try to talk. Uh, other good repeaters around here, uh, Lake Mountain. There's a repeater on Lake Mountain that is run by the Utah Valley Amateur Radio Club. And it has moderately good coverage up into Salt Lake, um, at least as far as here. I've hit it successfully with a handheld 
but you're much better with a mobile if you're trying to get on that. And then Antelope Island, the Davis Club has a repeater on Antelope Island, and you can hit that from here with a handheld. Again, if you've got a mobile or a base, you're much more likely to get into that. Uh, no, it's it's actually on Antelope Island. Promontory Point is a little bit farther north. Um, covers more into the Ogden, Brigham City area. Um, I don't think you can hit Promontory from here. Dave, you look like you've got something you want to say. You. Oh, okay. So you can receive the, the two meter, but it can't necessarily hear you where you're at with yeah. your handheld. But there is a 440 repeater, a 70 centimeter repeater that you can hit that's linked with that one. So if you transmit on that one, you can you can uh hear the hear your conversations on the uh on the seven six, right? Or seven six or seven eight? The seven eight. Okay. Um so what do you do if I don't hear anybody? I turn my radio on, I tune it into the repeater, I hear nothing. Well, try another repeater, try a different frequency. Uh look for a scheduled net. Or here's a a hard concept for some people. Call CQ yourself. I remember seeing this video. The guy was saying, you know, I've I've heard that the amateur radio is just dying. Nobody's ever talking on the radio. But I found a way to actually get people to talk. And he turned on his radio and he tuned around to an empty spot on the band and he picked up the microphone and he said, CQ, this is whatever his call sign was. And people came back to him and started talking. It was amazing. All you have to do is transmit something and people will talk back to you. What a concept, right? So just because you don't hear anybody, that doesn't mean nobody's out there. All right, let's talk about some scheduled nets. Mark, Murray Amateur Radio Club has several nets during the month. We do our Sunday evening net, which takes place every Sunday at 8 p.m. local time, normally on the club repeater. Right now, our repeater is not operational and we're using a simplex frequency for our Sunday evening net. So be aware of that. But um, information about that is here. However, Hopefully we have our repeater back up soon. Um, and then also a half an hour before each meeting night, we meet on the first three Thursdays of the month at 6.30. So at six o'clock on those Thursdays, we have a brief. And when I say brief, I mean really brief, right? If you aren't there within like a minute, you're probably gonna miss it, okay? It's a really quick check-in. People say, this is my call sign, I'm here, and that's about it, right? There's no traffic handled on that net, on those nets. It's it's very, uh, very fast. The original reason I started sending out information for that was I wanted it to be like a talk-in net where people would communicate while they were coming to the meeting. Yeah, that didn't happen. So it's it's turned into basically hey, figure out how to get your radio on this other frequency that you don't normally use and show yourself and others that you know how to actually set your radio up to do that. And, and that's actually not bad because one of those frequencies that we use for that is the simplex frequency that we've been using for our Sunday nets while the repeater's been offline. So uh, you're, you're welcome to join us on those. Other clubs also have scheduled nets. Your best bet for finding those is to check the club websites. I don't know of any comprehensive place to go search for nets. Does anybody know of anything where you can go to find nets? So Utah Arc Net. I know they have a page that lists a bunch of nets. It's I, it's, I wouldn't call it a comprehensive list. It lists nets that they've been told about. And in fact, I don't think our net is on that list. It might be, but I don't think it is. And so I know like Taylorsville, they have a regular net. Sandy has a regular net. Draper has a regular net. Lots of other clubs have nets down uh, on the uh, Lake Mountain repeater. 
there's a ladies net that they run every week. Um, there's uh, a new Crossroads is doing a net on Tuesday nights to help people learn the stuff for the general exam. Then there's a newcomers, new new hams net. Um, there are a lot of nets out there. And like I say, I, I don't know of a good comprehensive list and I'm not sure how you would build such a list or maintain such a list is the problem. So that's something that I've thought about. How would we as a, as a club maintain a list of nets out there? And I mean, the, the only thing we could do is put nets on there that we know about. Um, which, is what we have. which is what we have, which is what UARC has, right? So, uh, so there are some options. Your best bet, again, is to talk to other hams and ask them, hey, is there a net or any nets that you participate in that I could get on? And they will be happy to tell you of nets that they participate in, and then that will help you find those other nets. All right. So how do I join a net? Generally, nets will have some type of roll call. Now, these are done in different ways depending on the net, right? March net, we actually have a list or a roster of calls that we go through and call out to each person on that list and see if they respond or not. Um, other clubs will do some kind of grouping, like the Crossroads Club, when they do their net, they say anybody in the northeast quadrant of Salt Lake City check in now, and then the Southeast Quadrant, and then the Southwest Quadrant, and then the Northwest Quadrant. And so, you know, they're not calling everybody that's in those areas. They're just putting out a general call and saying, if you're in that area, call back now. Uh, Dan. What was the new AEC for Salt Lake County areas? And uh, I talked with him today. And uh, you did not hear this from me, but uh, I believe areas we're going to start doing the well A through F. Uh, please come back because right now we've been calling out the call signs, and we want to get it closer to what it will be like in an emergency because we're not going to have a roster right. during an emergency. So um, it's a common method of doing it. But we're going to talk. So when they say that, they say like A through F, what they mean is your suffix starts with A through F. So if you look at your call sign, it's basically got three parts, right? There's the prefix, which is K, A, W, or N. There's a digit, which indicates or used to indicate what region of the country you were in when you got your call sign. People actually used to get a new call sign when they moved to a different region. They don't require you to do that now. So you can, if you got your call sign in Florida, for example, you would have a four there and you could still be living here now and still use that call sign with a four in it. You used to have to change it when you moved. Um, and then the suffix is the trailing part. It's either one, two, or three uh, letters. And so when they say A through F, they mean the first one of those trailing suffix letters is in that A through F grouping. And so they would do like A through F, call now. People would call in and check in. And then they would say, okay, now G through M, check in your call now, and so on. Which means all the dead by the time they get to me. Is, me also, since I'm a Z, right? Yeah, uh, mine is, my call sign is KD7ZWV, right? So I'm like at the tail end, Charlie, there. Um, there's also like Racy's. Well, do they call it Racy's anymore? It's a Utah emergency services net or something yeah. like that now uh or utah department of emergency management or yeah. something like that yeah department of emergency management um division of emergency managers yeah. something like that anyway they used to have a racy they would issue everybody a racy's number and you could you would give your number when you checked in so you'd give your call sign your name and your number and they could look you up by any of those three um, preferably by the number, but uh, they don't use that number anymore. They just have people check in by call sign, but they do it based on county. So they'll start like in the southeast corner of the state with a few counties down there and have people check in. And then they'll move to, they'll typically start in the south and move north. Um, 
And then when they get to not quite to Utah County, they'll go north and they'll work down again. And then they'll do Utah County and Salt Lake County, which would be off. But um, they use yeah. the Intertie and Sinbad and IRLP and Echolink as well, I think. Um, and I think there's even another, there's a few other linked repeater networks that they tie into that. So it's all one giant net over the entire state, which is pretty crazy. Uh, they actually have regional net controls because if you were trying to net control the entire net from here, for example, it would never work because it takes about three seconds to key up that entire system. And that would make the check-ins take three times much as long, right? So they have like a local net control to a particular section of the state do that. And when they've completed their area, they hand it to the next net control for the next region and it moves throughout the state that way. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fun to participate in that. Uh, it takes about an hour and a half to check everybody in across the state. So that's uh, that's kind of telling that, you know, this kind of statewide net is not something we're going to be using in a full-scale emergency, most likely. We will be more localized. But it's still kind of interesting to participate in that and be able to take advantage of that. Uh, nets on HF also exist. And they will typically have people check in based on country or region, you know, continent or something like that. And they may have you check in based on uh, call sign suffixes as well. So it's kind of cool. Uh, let's see. All right. I think that covers that slide pretty much. Okay. What about calling CQ? So I mentioned some people say, well, you should never call CQ on a repeater. Um, I don't hold to that rule. I'll call CQ on a repeater. I don't care. Um, but some people think you should just say your call sign or say monitoring or listening. And the way I feel about it is if, if I call CQ, then you know I want to talk to somebody. I'm calling, generally calling anybody, right? That's what CQ means. So it's calling any station. Uh, if I say my call sign, yay, I had an identified transmission. What does that mean? Does that mean I want to talk to somebody? That means I'm testing my radio. Does that mean I got a new microphone? Does that mean, I don't know what it means. Uh, if I call and I say monitoring or listening, okay, you're monitoring or listening. Great. If nobody's talking, what are you listening to? So I don't have a problem with saying CQ. Now, you will hear people call out on the repeater their call sign and monitoring or listening. Go ahead and call back to them. They really want to talk to somebody. They're not just throwing their call out there for no reason. Um, feel free to respond when you hear somebody say something like that. Uh, I'm I'm comfortable with saying CQ. And I would say CQ from KD7 ZWB. And that's, you know, that's just basically saying to everybody out there, hey, I'm here. I want to talk to somebody. I'm not just turning my radio on because I like the, the pretty glow of the dials, right? I actually want to talk to somebody. There, so there was a question on the cast that how do you initiate a conversation on the on the repeater? And the correct answer was to say your call sign and then monitoring. So that's actually on the test? That was was one of the options to say CQ and that was an incorrect one? Okay. I think it was as far as I'm aware, there is no rule that says how you're supposed to do that, right? There's no FCC mandated rule that says how to do that. Um, the only thing that the FCC could come back with on that is you follow the generally accepted local practices, right? right? Yeah, right. So if, if that is, if everybody's decided, I don't want to hear C2, then that's all we should do, but you're not going to get a knock on the door from a three little letter agents, right? If you CQ somebody. And if the question didn't give the option of saying CQ as a wrong choice, then I'm not even sure why that question's in the pool, right? So 
Um, what were the other options? Do you remember? Okay, see if you can find. I'm curious now. Uh, if you can't find it, I'm going to have to go look for it. Okay. Another so, thing you can say, out of curiosity, or just for everybody to know, is, and I've used this before, is this repeater in use? And 7XDL. And that's kind of what you're supposed to do anyway, right? That's why you should always listen before you start talking, right? Right. right. But yeah, I mean, that's that's actually a valid thing to do. And in fact, that's recommended on HF frequencies when you find a blank frequency that you don't hear anybody on, throw out something and say, hey, uh, there's even a Q code for it. Uh, is it QSL or? It's like, I know there's a Q code for it. Um, but yeah, you can just say, is any is the frequency in use or is, is the, you know, am I interrupting anything basically is what you're asking. And because sometimes there are some frequencies that are, <laughs> They are, I want to say, set aside, and you notice I'm doing air quotes for set aside for a specific net, and I'm thinking specifically of a maritime net, that uh, those guys will get very upset if you start using that frequency for a general CQ call. Um, and it's not because they own the frequency, but there is a convention that that frequency is used for that purpose. And so somebody is likely to come back to you and say, hey, this is for the maritime. This frequency is for the maritime net. If you're not doing maritime net stuff, you probably shouldn't use this frequency. Or they may be much more rude than that when they say it. But, uh, you know, that's it's very easy for you to then say, whatever, 500 kilohertz higher or lower. And you don't have to worry about them anymore. Right. So I cannot find a Q code. you can't find a Q code. I swear there's a Q code for that. Hey, Jen, um, Jen, can you hear me? Jan? Yeah, go ahead. So I've got the test question here relating to oh. that that you were asking about. Yeah, go ahead, David. So uh, T2A09, I think this is the one you're referring to. Which of the following indicates that a station is listening on a repeater and looking for a contact? So answer A is CQ, CQ, followed by the repeater's call sign. B is the station's call sign followed by the word monitoring. C, the repeater call sign follows by the station's call sign, or D, QSY followed by your call sign. <laughs> okay. So the official answer is B. So, so out of those, yeah. Monitoring, not CQ. Out of those options, well, saying CQ and then the repeater's call sign would be wrong because you're not the repeater. So you shouldn't be IDing as the repeater. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, true. But but yeah, so that's uh, so that would be why that one's wrong. Uh, same thing with uh, what was the other one? There was one about um, yeah. the repeater's call sign followed by your call sign, yeah. and you're not talking to the repeater. You want to talk to anybody, right? But you don't. The repeater's not a person. It's not going to answer you. I mean, right. it'll ID back at you, but uh, it's not going to have a conversation with you. So that would be wrong. And then the QSY one basically says, change frequency to my call sign. And that doesn't make any sense at all, right? So the only possible one there would be give your call sign and monitoring. But I mean, I can see the confusion there where people could have interpreted that as you shouldn't say CQ, but that's not really what the question was saying was yeah, and there is a different there's a different question too that says what is the meaning of the procedural signal of CQ? And which is those those answers are calling the quarter hour, test transmission only, no reply expected. Only the called station should transmit, and then the correct answer calling any station. Yeah. Yeah. So CQ again, calling any station. It, to me, it makes sense to use it. Um I don't I don't have a problem using it on a repeater. I know some people do, and some people, if you stay CQ on a repeater, you might get some lid on the other end who says, uh, don't say CQ on a repeater because that's not how we do things around here. Well, that may be not how that guy does things around here, but it doesn't preclude you from doing it. So, um, well, let me ask you this. On Saturday, 
I heard a guy on, I was going through the route for the front runner, checking all the repeaters. And I heard a guy when I was up in Davis County call CQ by a CW on the repeater. <laughs> so he was doing modulated FM on the repeater? Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, uh, I went back to him and says, I actually you can modulate a CW. Do CQ other than the repeater's call sign. You can ID using CW, uh, but you cannot have a conversation on CW. You have to go to the data portions. So, sort of, right? Because if you think about it, there, there's CW and then there's MCW. Those are two different modes, right? Um, I don't know. That would be a gray area for me because CW is continuous wave. And that's what we usually talk about when we're talking about Morse code, right? And what's actually happening when you're doing CW is you're turning your transmitter on and off each time you send a dit or a dot, right? A, a dot or a dash sequence. Uh, and the amount of time that your transmitter is on determines if it's a dot or a dash or a space in between a dot or a dash, right? So modulated CW or MCW is when you actually produce an audio signal that's encoded in some other modulation like FM and you transmit that. So you actually key up and then you transmit tones as if they were CW tones, right? But you're not actually sending CW. So if you're really sending real CW, then yes, you should be on the data portion or data or CW portion of the band, right? But if you're sending MCW, I don't know if that applies because it's really audio that you're sending. It's phone that you're sending. So that would be a gray area. I would I would have to review some rules well, on that. The guy said, you can find us on the AMRL um, campaign plan that says, note, CW operation is permitted throughout all amateur bands. So that's why he said he was able to do that. And he says, well, that's not what it's saying. It's not saying you can use CW on the entire band. On the entire band. It's just you can find a CW spot on every single band. Right. That's what that means. So he he So if you look at the band plan at the band plan, you will see on each band there's a section that's green for phone and red for data. And then there's also a section that's got usually a little squiggly line for CW only, right? Um, but again, MCW isn't CW, right? It's actually phone. So that's, I mean, we repeaters ID with, with MCW all the time. They're not IDing with CW. They're not keying and unkeying as they do their thing. They're, they're keying up and sending an audio sequence that sounds like CW would sound if you were decoding CW, but it's not really CW. So I don't know that I would have to look, I'd have to dig through the rules on that to see what the rules are on that. But I don't think there's a reason why you couldn't have an MCW conversation on a phone channel. And in fact, I know there's a net that helps you to learn Morse code using MCW on uh, VHF frequency. And I think there's even one around here that does that. At least there used to be. Um, and, and that would certainly be a conversation happening in MCW on a phone frequency. So I'll have to look into that, Dan. That's, a, that's an interesting point. It certainly is fine for you to set your radio up to ID yourself in, in MCW. Um, in fact... I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of Mike E encoding or Mike as a, an APRS thing. And if you don't know what APRS is, APRS is the uh, automatic packet reporting system. And the, uh, the guys who were doing this back in the 80s and 90s came up with a very condensed encoding that they called Mike E. And you would build a little circuit that would attach to your microphone. And when you unkeyed your microphone, it would squirt out a burst of this mic E position data or uh, packet data. And essentially you were appending a packet on every transmission that you made. 
And that packet includes your call sign. And so technically, that could be your ID. You wouldn't have to verbally identify on your transmissions because you're transmitting that mic e signal on the end of every transmission. That's my assumption anyway. Don't don't take that as law. Don't go buy a mic e encoder for your mic and then stop IDing verbally. But uh, yeah, go ahead. No, it's not sub audible. It's definitely audible. Um, but it would be, uh, so what people would do is they'd set up decoders attached to repeaters that would receive this mic e signal and decode it and retransmit it or digipede it on the regular APRS frequency. So um, I don't think anybody really does that anymore. I don't know. I know a lot of radios have mic e capability built into them, like this one, for example, it will use mic e encoding because that takes up less space than the un mic e, the regular not mic e encoded data. But I don't know of a way to set this to put it on the end of every transmission that you make, or even, you know, every 10th transmission that you make or whatever. I don't know of a way to do that with this radio. I haven't fully gone through the entire settings and there may be a way to make it do that. I don't know, but uh, yeah. So as far as that goes, and, and we kind of dove deep into a tangent on this one on the IDing, but it's always, that's why I love having these meetings because, you know, I'll put together a slide deck about something that I think, oh, this will take about an hour to go through. And an hour and a half later, we're halfway through the deck because we've had these side conversations that I hadn't planned on, but that contain great information and information that you would not be able to share otherwise, right? Or not typically share otherwise. So uh, all this stemmed from, do we say CQ on the repeater or not, right? Uh, great fun, this is, this is awesome. All right, so what if nobody answers? So I said my call sign, I said CQ, nobody comes back. Well, it's, what was that? Sell your radio. <laughs> Turn your radio off, put it in the box, go home. No, um, it's possible no one's listening, right? Uh, sometimes people are out there, uh, they don't want to talk. To I do this sometimes and I, I feel bad about it when I hear somebody call CQ or I hear somebody come on the repeater and I've like just pulled in the driveway and I'm like, do I respond to this guy and sit here for 10 minutes and have a conversation or do I just shut the radio off and go in the house? Um, and unfortunately, 99% of the time I shut the radio off and I go in the house. Right. But, um, but yeah, so there, there may be people out there that hear you, but they just don't want to talk. What can you do when that happens? Try again, repeat your call. Uh, sometimes if you say something like, this is KD7ZWV. I'm a new ham and this is my first time on the air. Is anybody out there? All of a sudden, 900 people want to be your friend, right? Um, so, you know, sometimes throwing a little extra information in there can help. Testing is another one that will usually get somebody to come back, even if it's just to tell you, yeah, I can hear you. You sound fine. You're getting into the repeater well. Um, it may not be, it may not lead into a full on conversation with a person. But at least you'll know somebody else is out there and they heard you, right? So testing is a good a good thing you can use. Yeah. You can use a not a very wide known secret that I learned. Getting people to talk to you. All you gotta say is you're a CYL. <laughs> or you identify as a CYL. As a YL of some type? Of some type. I think I don't think that would help you, Dan. Except maybe on maybe on Morse code, maybe on Morse code you might get away with that. But uh, on CW you might get away with that. But uh, yeah, YL is young lady, right? So if if you're a, a amateur radio operator and you're talking about your YL, you're talking about your girlfriend, and if you're talking about your XYL, you're talking about your wife, right? Don't call her an old lady. Don't do that. And typically, you'll hear people refer to other hams as old men, right? Uh, doesn't matter if you're 12 or 70, you're an OM if you're on the radio, right? So 
Uh, you may, I, I don't think, yeah, some of us are 12, right? Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard a young lady on the radio talk about her XYM or XOM or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's the thing that you will hear sometimes. Uh, my XYL said, get off the radio and come to bed. Um, so I got to go by, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah. So. But in age gap, anytime we hear a female on there, what, especially contesting, they are the best magnets to have. It, it, it is incredible. So that's another thing, right? Contest. CQ contest, KD7ZWV. Somebody's going to come back and find out what, what contest are you in? What are you doing? What? Well, I'm doing uh, worked all neighborhoods, right? So, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, they hear contest and that perks up some ears. Or POTA or SODA. POTA is parks on the air. SODA is summits on the air. Uh, people actually drag their radio to the top of mountains just to try to make contacts. If you throw out that, hey, this is a SODA contact, somebody will come back to you. Uh, because they're they're interested in doing that, right? People are interested in that. Um, okay, so try again, basically, is the first thing you can do. You can try a different repeater or a different frequency, or you can put the radio down, go have a snack or a tasty beverage, and come back and try it again later. Because sometimes, literally, there's nobody out there. That does happen, right? So uh, it, it's unfortunately a more common occurrence now than it used to be that there's nobody listening. Um, it used to be almost guaranteed if you got on the six, two, that Gordon Smith would come back to you uh, no matter what. Unfortunately, Gordon is no longer with us, so he's not going to come back. And if he did come back to you, you've got other problems that I don't think we can deal with in this class, but uh, no, seriously, there, there are some people out there who, uh, Venus used to always be on the radio. I haven't heard Venus on the radio in forever. Um, but she she actually had a scanner set up in her kitchen that would scan all the local repeaters. And so that was another thing. Another point was, if you're calling out CQ, say what frequency you're calling CQ on. Hey, this is KD7ZWB, CQ on Farnsworth repeater um, on the 6-2. Then, no, she, she's very old. Uh, right. <laughs> Venus, uh, she's a great old lady, but uh, yeah, I, I know Linda is still active. The UARC, yeah. I know Linda is still active and she still attends UARC right, routinely. Uh, and you still hear her on the air occasionally, but um, I haven't heard Venus in a long time. Um, and and you can't, I got to say, you can't just say Farnsworth. You got to say the 6-2 because there are actually multiple repeaters on Farnsworth. So be be aware of that. If you say Farnsworth, there, there are at least three that I know of on Farnsworth Peak. Yeah, so... Um, so be be more specific if you do that. But if somebody is scanning and they hear you, they may go look at their scanner and it's already moved on. And so they don't know which frequency you're on. So while they're watching, if you call again, they'll see you and then they can come back to you. So again, don't hesitate to repeat your call. Okay. Now here's the big one, right? I'm afraid to push the button. So we have this button on the side of the radio. It's called the PTT button. Uh, some people call it the RTL button, release to listen, uh, but push to talk is the, the PTT button, right? So there's this thing called mic fright. And if you just got your license and you've just uh, bought your radio and got it all set up, but you've never talked on it, it's a real thing to be nervous about keying up that first time, right? Uh, as I As I say here, what if I make a mistake? What if I sound like a dork, right? Trust me, everybody sounds like a dork. So don't don't worry about that. Uh, what if nobody wants to talk to me? Well, sometimes there's nobody to talk to. But in general, people don't know you, right? 
what if I can't remember their call sign? The guy gave me his call sign and I have no idea what it was. Um, I have that problem a lot because people will throw their call sign at you so fast that it's like, uh, a kilo something, you know, and, and then you can just ask them what their call sign is. I didn't catch your call sign. Can you give it to me again in phonetics? Slowly. We've been talking about this since the shakeout, right? Because one of the things that happened during the shakeout practice nets was people were throwing their call signs around rapidly. And we're trying to copy these down on paper. And, you know, it's like, well, I got a third of that. Did you get any of that? Nope. I didn't. I got nothing, you know. And so there were a lot of requests for, could you repeat your call sign, please? Or sometimes people will, in the heat of the moment, forget to give you their call sign. Right. Um, one thing that I. And they don't know what I have a call sign of my own. Yeah. What is that? I can't remember. I've been operating as a club call sign for the last hour. So I, I wait, I need to identify. It's been an hour. So who do I identify as? You know, no. It, I mean, one of my suggestions for this is make yourself a little cheat sheet or a little script. It doesn't have to have much on it. Your call sign, where you are physically, right? I'm in Murray. Well, I'm on a this kind of radio. This is my antenna, whatever. Because a lot of people will say one of the first conversations that you have on the radio will be, what kind of radio do you have? Everybody seems to want to know that. Nobody really cares what kind of radio you have, but it's an icebreaker. It's a, it's a thing you can ask, right? A black one, yeah. Yeah. Um, my very first QSO, uh, I had gotten my license, and the the guy who was my Elmer, uh, his name was Jeff Payne. Uh, he lived up in Heber, or Charleston. Um, he had loaned me a radio. It was one of the old HTX 202s, the the brick radios. This thing was like the size and shape of a brick, and it weighed as much as a brick. Right? Uh, it had ten memory channels. And the particular one that he loaned me, the uh, CTCSS tone encoder didn't work. So the only repeater I could actually talk on was the 6.2, which didn't require a tone. Um, and so the very first time I went to key up, I'm like, there's the button, okay? My thumb's on it. Now I got to say something. Um, I finally threw out my call sign and... Uh, David, KD7UUF, came back to me, and he was like, hey, how are you doing, you know, and, uh, well, I, I don't know if I can't do David's drawly voice, but he has this, this particular way of articulating himself that is different from other people that I've talked to, and, you know, he was like, I'd heard him on the radio, I'd listened, I'd monitored the radio a lot, you know, listening to people, so I kind of knew how, how things worked and I'd heard him before and he came back to me and his first question was, what kind of radio do you have? And I was able to tell him, I have this uh, Radio Shack HVX 202. And he said, oh, wow, I haven't seen one of those in a long time. That's a great radio. And I said, well, this one's not so great, but it's what I have in my hand right now. And, and we started a conversation. We, we talked for a good 10 minutes about radios and he told me what he was using and we talked about antennas and stuff and David lives up in Syracuse. And so we were talking on the 6-2 repeater. I could hear him perfectly, he could hear me, um, but it was, a, it was a great little conversation. And, um, you know, that will always stand out in my memory. Again, this is 20 years ago and it stands out in my memory that I had that first conversation with him, so. Uh, but make yourself a little cheat sheet. Write your call sign down so you don't have to try to remember what it is. Write it out in phonetics, too, if you want. Just to, so when someone says, oh, can you give me that in phonetics? You don't have to try to remember, uh, is it uh, Zulu or Zimbabwe? I don't, you know, what, what am I doing? So you have it written down. So all you have to do is look at it and read it. Uh, what type of radio you have? What type of antenna you have? Having something written down that you can look at can take a lot of the pressure off when you're making that first contact, that first QSO. Dan. I have a friend of mine 
uh, my original call sign, KB7 UMB or something like that. And underneath of it, under the K, it would be Kilo. You know, I did that because I'm freaking afraid that I didn't screw it up. And it turns out nobody cares. Nobody cares, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No one called me on it. Um, now you will hear, you will hear people use very creative phonetics on the radio and it annoys me no end because especially if it's a serious call for something like an exercise or something like that. But I hear people say kilowatt seven, blah, 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 all the time. And I'm like, okay, is that kilo seven or is that kilo whiskey seven? What, you know, what actually are you using here? Talk to me, you know. But I always try to use the official phonetics, except for the letter I, which we've talked about before. Uh, <laughs> now, this I is India. And for whatever reason, in my brain, I had indigo. And so I, I actually used this in a class last year. And, and I was using, I had, it, I had a chart on the screen with indigo. And uh, I think it was Paul called me out on it and said, uh, you know, it's not indigo, it's India. And I'm like, really? Are you sure? And, and sure enough, he was sure, and he was right. But uh, you got to take off, Dave. Well, thanks for coming, Dave. Appreciate you. But uh, yeah, so have something written down that you can look at. That way you are not panicking, trying to remember what you wanted to say, okay? Yeah, something like that, right? That can happen. And and normally it's no big deal. Normally it's no big deal. We know what you're talking about, right? Um, in fact, on the website, I have the phonetic alphabet. Uh, there's a, a page with that on it. And uh, if you go to the website and you go, or you search for phonetic, you'll find it. And it's full of really bad uh, suggestions for phonetics to use for the various letters. For example... Uh, for I, the suggested word is I, right? And, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's humorous. It's meant to be humorous. So, um, okay. So <clears throat> have an idea of what you want to say. Something good to talk about is something you are familiar with. For example, if you are interested in another hobby, like photography or model rocketry or something like that, uh, I'm interested in flying, so I'm always happy to talk about flying, aviation. Uh, I'm also interested in history, and military history in particular, uh, including ancient military history, not just modern day, you know, uh, the last 200 years or whatever. Uh, so you can always bring up, hey, I'm interested in this other hobby. Uh, what hobbies do you have? Uh, David is a big, or used to be big on uh, metal detecting. He would go out and use his metal detector to try to find stuff. And he would routinely find all kinds of cool stuff. And he'd talk about it on the radio. Uh, I don't, I know his health hasn't been great. And I don't think he's been out doing that for a while. But, um, but so you can talk about your other hobbies that you have. Um, another one that's good is how do, how do I sound? How's my audio? Um you want to, you can't hear yourself, right? When you're talking on the repeater, you're transmitting, so you're not receiving and you can't really hear yourself. So getting some feedback about how your audio sounds, it can be very helpful. Um, you'll sometimes hear people who are way back here, away from the microphone, and you can barely hear what they're saying if you listen really well, you know? And so, or you're really loud, you know, they're really right on top of the mic. And it's popping and blasting and all the, you know, there's constant noise and all kinds of stuff. Those are techniques that as you get more comfortable with your hardware, you will have less problems like that. But you don't know that you have that problem unless somebody tells you, somebody who can hear you on the radio tells you. Dan, you had a comment. I just going to say, I, I'm the loud mouth. Everybody like that. And I'm on the radio because I know I talk loud. I always hold the microphone on the side, uh, and that seems less burdensome to most people. Oh, I will do that as well. I'll actually hold the microphone. I'll hold it like this and talk across the mic rather than directly into the mic, and then you don't get the popping noises that are typical 
when somebody is talking directly into the microphone. You'll hear that somebody you'll hear somebody talking and there'll be this constant popping every time they say a particular uh, sound, you'll get this popping noise. Um, I know like professional uh, music artists and professional speakers will use a, a device called the popper stopper, which is like a little membrane that goes between their mouth and the microphone itself. And it masks those, but we don't have that with amateur radio typically, unless you're using a boom microphone or something. Um, but if you get in the habit of holding it a little bit off to the side, so you're talking across the mic, then you don't generally have those kinds of problems. So something, something to think about. Um, what radio do you have is a great question to throw out there. Everybody's got a radio or they're not talking on the radio, right? So you can talk about what kind of radio you've got. Um, if the other operator asks you questions, try to be conversational. And as I say here, do you like the hobby so far? Yes. Okay, what do you like about it? Yeah. Uh, I like the hardware. I like, you know, I'm interested in digital modes. You want to like talk to the person. Imagine you just met somebody at a party or whatever, and you want to have a conversation with them. Have a conversation with them. It's just like that on the radio. You're having a conversation with someone. There's nothing. The only difference is they're not in the room with you. Boom, right? They're somewhere potentially 100 miles away or more, right? But if you have a mentality in your head that they're standing in front of you, talk how you would talk to them if they were standing in front of you. That will go a long distance toward making you a good operator on the radio, right? Um, let's see. The other thing is to remember, we all made a very first contact at one point, right? Just because this is your first contact doesn't mean that the person you're talking to has no idea what you're experiencing and what you're going through. They've been through this before as well. So they know what you're facing and they want to try to help you overcome that, okay? So some other tips for overcoming mic fright, check out contesting. Contesting gives you a very programmatic, scripted thing that you need to do or say, right? You don't have to make up a topic or come up with something. Everything that you're doing is pretty much the same on every contact. You're giving your name, your call sign, your grid square signal report. Name, call sign, grid square signal report. Everybody that you talk to. You'll talk to 100 people doing a contest, and that's all you will ever say is your name, call sign, grid square, and signal report. And that's what they will be saying back to you as well. When you're doing a contest, you don't have time to have a long, drawn-out conversation. So why do that? People do that because that gets them more comfortable with talking on the radio. And then the next time you're tuning around and you hear somebody talking and you'll think, I know that guy's call sign or I recognize that voice. And it's somebody that you've actually talked to before in the context of a contest, but you actually have some connection already, right? Um, Look into other modes that don't require talking. Some people don't like to talk. I don't know how they get into amateur radio if they don't like to talk, but some people don't like to talk, right? Um, there are digital modes available that do not require you to ever pick up a microphone. You can protect your computer to the radio. You do everything through the computer. You're typing back and forth. There are textual modes that you can use that don't require you to talk at all. Um, another suggestion, learn Morse code and try CW. You're not actually talking to them on CW. You're just pushing the bar back or hitting that key up and down. That's all you're doing, right? You're actually having a conversation with someone, but you're not talking to them. And sometimes that can be all the difference, right? Um, another thing that I suggest is set up a regular conversation with someone you already know. For example, get on a net. Everybody on the net knows everybody else on the net. They hear them every week. You can get on there and you can start talking. Or if you have a friend who got you into amateur radio, 
set up a time when both of you get on the radio on the same frequency and you talk to each other. And that will help you to get over this uh, mic fright issue. It is a real thing. So don't don't think I'm, you know, I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to minimize it. It's a real thing. Mike Fright is a real thing. And we, when we started this club, how many people had never talked on their radio, Dan? 80% of the members of the club had never talked on their radio. Some of them, Sherwood, turned on their radio twice a year and then turned it back off again. Right? Um, you know, if you have the opportunity to, to get over that, that's what you need to do. Once you get over it, you'll find you can talk to anybody. You don't have to know who they are. You'll hear somebody say, uh, my call sign testing, and you'll come back and have a three-hour conversation with them about what they're testing and what they're playing with and why they bought a new antenna and how they've got it mounted and where the cable runs and what kind of cable did they use. And, you know, you'll have a conversation with them and you'll feel very comfortable doing that. And then you'll realize, holy cats, I just had a three hour conversation on the radio. I didn't even know I could do that. Okay. All right. So I've made my first cue. So and I forgot the ID. Yeah. Right. I just had a three hour conversation on the radio and I forgot the ID. Oh, no, the FCC is going to be mad at me. Uh, okay. I made my first cue. So congratulations. You're now an amateur radio operator. What's next? What do I do now? Okay. <laughs> Dan likes to buy a lot of radios if you haven't figured that out. So when he says sell the radio, he means sell it to him for a very steep discount. Um, okay. So what's next? Learn more about radio. How does it actually work? How do repeaters work? How does HF work? How do digital modes work? How about linked repeater system? We talked about the inner tie. We talked about Sinbad uh, with the Racy's net uh, or whatever they call it now, the Utah Dem net or something. I don't know what they call it. Um, what about inter internet connected modes? How does that work? What other bands or modes are there to explore? Get an upgrade on your license, branch out into HF. Get involved with your local club. Do some activities. There's a ton of stuff to learn and a ton of stuff to do. And you will get out of it what you put into it. All right. What can I do with my license? Talk to people. Contesting. Soda, quota. Field day. Field day is a great one. If you have never done that before, you should really go do it at least once. Just to say that you've done it, right? Um what field day is, is people take their gear out typically to a field, hence the name field day, and they set it all up and then they operate for 24 hours trying to make as many contacts as they can make on as many bands and as many frequencies as they can in as many different modes as they can in order to get points, which they use to compete and try to get the coveted I-1 field day slot. Not that there's anything that you get from that, except being able to say, I got X number of points. Ooh, yay me, right? No, there's no point. No, you might get a certificate. You could get your name in the in the magazine, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, there's no there's no real prizes. Uh, if you happen to complete your worked all states while you're doing field day, then you can get your worked all states certificate. I guess that could be a prize. Um, oh, I got my worked all neighbors. Worked all neighbors? Yeah. <laughs> of course, one of them you were working through their television, so that you know that's probably why. But <laughs> there you go. I know Dan has about eight million T-shirts. So, since you were the net control, were you using the, the one we helped you put up? Um, I was using my disco antenna. Uh, I, I, I didn't. You probably did say it. I was just like, I, uh, I, I did because I was net control. 
So I was interested in how everybody can. I didn't, I didn't hear very many people on on that. I heard more people on the 220 than I heard on. That actually doesn't surprise me because 220 has some really interesting characteristics that uh, beat the pants up at two meters in certain cases. So. Well, that's because we live we live close by, so you would hear us. Yeah. yeah. See, and I could hear. Like in Riverton, you know, I heard that. I heard well, and I almost think about the radio. I was outside talking. That's how I. Yeah. Nobody can hear me because you're mad. All right. So another thing you can do: take part in public service events. Bike races, marathons, and other runs, parades, search and rescue operations. These things are out there. They, all of these types of events want amateur radio operators to help out. I have participated in the bike MS ride probably eight or nine years now. I'm not going to do it this year. I have another obligation this year. This is the same weekend, but I would go up to Logan and operate radio at an aid station for the bike MS hundred mile ride. And uh, it's a great opportunity for you to practice using your radio, for you to get comfortable with taking your radio somewhere where you're not sitting at home and with talking to people that you don't necessarily talk to on a daily basis, um, including interacting with other people at the aid station and I can't tell you how many writers I had come up to me and say, oh, I'm an amateur radio operator, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this this weekend. Um, it's, it's really, you know, it, you're really providing a service, and it's really a great thing. Uh, we do routinely, every year, we do the Murray um, Fourth of July parade. So we have, what do we have, like 10 stations set up? eight to 10, something like that, maybe eight stations. So we, so if you are familiar with the Murray Parade, they have little awnings set up along the parade route where they have um, typically uh, public radio announcers like from the local radio stations who will get on the loudspeaker and say, you know, this is the quote that's coming through now and read the little blurb about it and that. We put an amateur radio operator at each of those stations with them because sometimes the order of floats in the parade changes dynamically or a float disappears mid-parade, which has happened on more than one occasion. Or, I mean, so last year I was at the entrance to Murray Park over here on Vine Street and this one guy and quote, comes by and they're supposed to make the turn down in the park. He just kept right on going. <laughs> and so we announced, hey, this float left the parade. So, you know, they're not going to be at the end or they may show up at the end, but they're not going to go the right way to get there. But uh, one of the things that happened was the blurb for a particular float was completely missing in the, the document that all of these people, they get like a little book that has all the information in it. And this one particular float had nothing. And we were able to get the information for that and distribute it via the radio to all of the announcers so that all the announcers actually had the correct blurb for that float. This happened this, just this last year. So uh, it's it's a thing, you know, it's, a, it's an actual service that we do that is useful to the community. Uh, search and rescue, I put TERP on here. TERP is the, Timpanogos Emergency, Timpanogos Emergency Response Team. TERT. Ah, I should change that. I'll change that in the slide. Uh, TERT. Um, these are amateur radio operators who spend their summer on the side of Timpanogos Mountain helping people who get stuck on the mountain. And they not only will help them get help if they need it, but they'll actually provide first aid help and things like that. So uh, these are amateur radio operators that dedicate some of their time to doing that. And I know Dan has participated in that before. Um, uh, I used to work with another operator who did that routinely. And 
you know, there, that's a, a really great service that is provided there. Uh, we've got training. I just came back from an advanced first aid course up there. Uh, a doctor who just came from Ukraine uh, taught how to stop the bleed as far as bullet wounds and that kind of stuff. I mean, real practical stuff uh, that you don't get at the Red Cross Stop the Bleed um, class course. Yeah. Uh, we've got the front runner century coming up. Is it next week? It's the week after. It's the 18th, no, it's right? Next, week, next Saturday. Not this Saturday, but the Saturday after. May 11th. I was thinking it was yeah, the 18th. I was thinking it was the 18th. So, uh, okay. Well, I'm glad you told me that. <laughs> anyway, so that's a bike race that starts in Salt Lake and goes along the Front Runner route all the way up into Ogden. And so there are multiple aid stations along the way. There are SAG or uh, support and gear vehicles driving on the parade route to help people whose bike breaks down or they get a flat tire or something like that. There are motorcycle mobile radio operators who go out ahead of the course and trailing the course to make sure that people are going the right way all the markings are in the right place, things like that. Also that uh, nobody gets missed and lost on the course, right? And, and doesn't ever finish. We make sure we find all of those people and get them to where they need to be. So um, that is a, a an event that happens annually. Uh, Pony Express is doing one. When is that? I can't remember when that is. Yeah, I, I don't remember. They there so there's a reenactment of the Pony Express that's coming up here. Um, no, they do it on horses. Yep, and they will start in. Where do they start? They start in. Right where the Evanston location is. That's where. That's where they come into Utah. Yeah, but this actually covers. Yeah, this starts in like St. Louis. <laughs> and goes all the way to California. And they actually follow the route of the Pony Express. There's going to be amateur radio operators all along that course helping out with that, just in case something goes wrong or people need help or whatever. Yeah, Rulon at the Taylorsville Club is uh, spearheading that effort here in, uh, in Utah. So in Utah, they're coming into the state around Evanston, and they will travel through Salt Lake, and they'll go out uh, farther south. Where is it? It's towards Eli, right? Uh, so down uh, like past Delta and out that direction. So um, that's a, a great opportunity to exercise your amateur radio skills. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a ton of events out there that you can get involved in. So when they do that, they do two beer. Whatever, whatever they can get they will use whatever they need and they will often like we've got what three repeaters set aside for the front runner one because it's over such a long distance the low to jaw bike race amateur radio is heavily involved in that uh, that's a race that goes from logan utah all the way to jackson hole um, and they have i think five separate regions that are involved in that so that's been going on for a long time. Yeah. Um, it's that bike also is, has a big one too. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things. things. There's a lot of things. Uh, UtahSAG.org, if you want information about what's out there that you can volunteer to help with. Or talk to me. Or talk to Dan. Because Dan, you kind of took over after Ricky. Yeah. So. Does anybody want the job? Uh, did you want the job is the question. <laughs> you, you'll usually get a shirt and you'll probably get a free lunch um, depending on what the event is right um, like the, the Pony Express one starts at like 2 o'clock in the morning in Evanston and uh, goes like 24 hours through the state and uh, I don't know it's like 4 a.m. when they leave Utah so yeah it's it's a full it's a full scale gig so 
But don't worry, you're you you will only have a two or four hour. Typically. Yeah. Typically. You'll 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 be assigned a block that that would be yours, right? <laughs> right. Um, so we also have several more of these getting started with amateur radio sessions coming up, where we've talked about several things already about getting your license and getting your equipment and programming your equipment and that kind of stuff. Now getting on the air today, we will be talking in the future on these first Thursday classes for Mark about additional topics that fit into things you can do with your radio as an, as someone who's just getting started. So things like public service events, we're going to actually have a class on that. Uh, being net control, how to run a net, we'll have a class on that. Uh, introductions to digital modes, we'll have probably several classes on those. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's coming down the pipeline. So, you know, feel free to join us or just check out the website and you'll see these as they get posted. So, um, Go out there and communicate. We can do one on Moon Bounce. Moon Bounce, or they call it EME, Earth, Moon, Earth. Um, the, the moon is sitting out there a quarter of a million miles away, and you can send a signal at it, and that signal will bounce off of it and come back to the Earth. And people do that for fun. Um, it's... Some of those setups are pretty crazy, man. Yeah, I have seen Peter. I have and seen Peter. I have seen some setups that will blow your mind for moon bounce. Uh they've got systems that are like, you know, four uh helically polarized antennas mounted on a rig that tracks the moon. And you know, it's there's some there's some cool stuff that can be done with that. Um Satellite work. There are a ton of satellites, including the ISS. Did you know that there's an amateur radio transmitter receiver on the ISS? And there are times when most of the astronauts are actually amateur radio operators, licensed amateur radio operators. There are times when they have a break in their schedule that they will get on that radio and talk to people on Earth. And you, you might only have a few minutes to chat with them because of how fast it moves, but you can actually talk to them from from a, a radio like this with the right antenna. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. But uh, yeah, go out there, communicate. That's what it's all about, folks. Talking to people. Get out there and talk to people. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. I can find the button. And... That's it.